read you uh, a chapter from my new baby, expiration date, and uh, because of the theme of vertigo, helped me to pick the only thing that I could read that had a vertigo theme, so it's easy to pick the three. And I guess you should know that this chapter is from the point of view of one of the protagonists named Muriel, who is an 86-year-old woman who's recently been widowed and met a man at a bridge tournament, and um, he invited her to go out on a road trip across the Southwest. And so she's <coughs> taken off with him, and you should know that Muriel is um, a Jewish woman from Beverly Hills, and the man she met is a cracker from the South. And <laughs> that doesn't really enter in here. <laughs> So, um, also, so they've been traveling around the Southwest playing bridge, but she's decided that they would take a little side trip and go to Sedona, Arizona, and uh, do a little, some tourist things. And so, one thing they decided to do was take a, a, a small plane to the Grand Canyon and uh, visit the Grand Canyon together. So they went out in a small plane, it was a biplane, and it started to snow, and they had to come back. And so this is the next day when um, the, the trip has been rescheduled. This time, their pilot was waiting for them inside the airport. He was chatting it up with a glamorous, if hard-looking, Russian woman. She was wearing tight jeans and high-heeled boots, and the pilot was standing over her, towing the rug with one sneakered foot. The Russian woman, who looked to be somewhere in her 30s, had blonde hair framing her white, white face and red, red lips. Her bored, middle school-aged daughter, who wore jeans and a pink sweatshirt, lounged nearby. Standing menacingly at the counter was the great gray hulk of a man, her father, who was visiting from the Ukraine and didn't speak a word of English. Muriel had heard the blonde tell the pilot this in her thick Russian accent. She lived in Washington, D.C., and he had spent a week with her there, and now they were all on a road trip. Apparently, this little family was going on their jaunt to the Grand Canyon. Yesterday, she and Wilbur had been the only people on the trip. Now they would be sharing the experience with these people. We're just waiting for a couple more folks, the man who was to be their pilot today told them. Muriel's family had come from the Ukraine originally in the 1880s. They had immigrated here to get away from the Ukrainians who liked to get drunk, rape, and disembowel Jews. But <laughs> this, giant, this giant had no way of knowing she was Jewish. Then the couple they, uh, they must have been waiting for walked into the room. Somewhere in their 60s, they were also behemoths. Muriel didn't know why she found huge people so frightening. Perhaps it was because <laughs> she knew they could crush her if they chose to. Wilbur was large, and his size put a little zest into their relationship, a slight element of fear that kept it interesting. But these people made him look small. They could eat him for dinner. It turned out the last couple to arrive were from Alberta. They both wore blue jeans. He was wearing a cowboy hat and an immense black jacket with leather sleeves and the insignia of his labor union on the back. She had bright red nails, large ones, on the ends of her fingers laden with ornate rings. Perhaps she thought that bringing attention to her hands would keep people from noticing how large she was, Muriel opined. If Muriel were as massive as this woman, she would kill herself. But that <laughs> thought had probably never crossed this woman's mind. She was large and homely and a perfect match for her bulky husband. Apparently, where she came from, one simply accepted one's homeliness without any expectation that things could have been different. <laughs> Muriel found such fatalism depressing. The gaudy rings on the woman's fingers made Muriel suspect that they had struck it rich in oil. That was what Alberta was known for, she seemed to remember. So now they were rich and traveling to the Grand Canyon for a holiday because that's what people did when they made all their money and their grandchildren were getting old and they still had a little life left in them. They were going to see something extraordinary so, so that 
When the time came to die, they wouldn't have to say, I'm dying, and I never saw the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> they thought that if they saw the Grand Canyon now, before they were on their deathbeds, they would be able to die in peace when they came to the end of the line. The pilot, who was not grizzled, wiry, the, not the grizzled, wiry pilot Muriel and Wilbur had had yesterday, was a man of about 40 with a military haircut. He led them out to a small silver plane. Muriel was sorry they weren't going in the biplane again, but it was too small to take them all, these eight people who had been brought together for some purpose by fate. The pilot started arranging them by weight to balance the load. Muriel was placed behind the incredible Ukrainian Hulk. She was going to have to look at his craggy, cold, murderous profile all the way to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Wilbur was seated behind her, silent as usual. Through the window, out of the corner of her eye, she saw the pilot climbing up the wing. Was this how a pilot normally climbed into the cockpit, she wondered? <coughs> Finally, when everyone put on their seatbelts, the plane droned into the air. Then Muriel heard the pilot talking to them through the earphones. He told them what was beneath them, all the evocative names of the red rock formations, and he told them about himself. He had just returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. He would spent a lot of time in these hot spots. He was not at liberty to tell them what he had been doing there, just that the pay was very, very good. <laughs> the information gave Muriel some confidence that the pilot knew what he was doing and the plane wouldn't crash, but also made her wonder how inclined to take chances this guy might be. <laughs> After another half hour, they landed safely in the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Handlers were there to help them out and to hustle them into the gift shop, which was filled with tourists from Las Vegas, who were mostly Japanese. They would go home satisfied that they had seen the real America. Muriel picked up a little papoose doll and turned it over. It was made in China. <laughs> After they had time to shop, their little group was led out to the tarmac, array arrayed in a line, and instructions about helicopter safety were read out loud to them. They were each given a card with these instructions in several languages. The most important instruction was not to get too close to the back of the helicopter, because if you did, the rotors might slice you to ribbons. They were then hustled to where the <laughs> helicopters were waiting and helped inside. Muriel got the shotgun seat. The pilot seemed to be a mere boy, a boy playing with military toys. That was why people volunteered to fight in Iraq, Muriel thought. It was because of the toys, these <laughs> wonderful toys. The helicopter was all transparent plastic. It was quite beautiful, and riding in it, was like floating on air. It lifted up and then it floated down into the canyon, staying close to one wall, so close that Muriel could have reached out and touched a cactus clinging to it. It was amazing, like being an insect. But all too soon, they were at the bottom of the canyon where handlers were helping them out and away from the slashing propellers, down a wooden staircase to the Colorado River where more handlers were waiting to help them into boats. Their boat took off, and they were going down the river with other boats ahead, behind, and to each side, with helicopters rising and falling all around them. After about 20 minutes, the boat stopped, and the boat pilot asked them if they wanted their pictures taken. He took a picture of each party with their own cameras, so when they got home, they could put a picture in their album showing them floating in a peaceful boat down the Colorado River at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. In the picture, there was no deafening helicopter noise. In the picture, they would be alone in the boat, in the river, in the canyon, forever. Anyone looking at the picture, including themselves, would imagine that they had spent endless hours in the boat, by themselves, in the river, in the canyon. But as soon as the last picture was snapped, the boat was turned around and they sped back to the platform at the wooden staircase where handlers were waiting to help them out. <laughs> they were on the river a total of 40 minutes. <laughs> they climbed the wooden staircase again where, at the top, handlers were ready to help them back into the helicopter, <laughs> which carried them back up to the rim of the canyon in a matter of minutes. That was what her life had been like. It had all gone so quickly 
and soon she would die, and then she would ride in a helicopter <laughs> or some other heavenly conveyance up to the rim. After they had been helped out of the helicopter and had avoided walking into the rotors, they were led to the bus, <laughs> which was waiting to take them to where the Indians were going to serve them lunch up at Guano Point. The pilot was with them on the bus. He told them they should present their lunch tickets when they arrived, and he described what they would be eating, corn on the cob, coleslaw, meat, beans, cornbread, and his personal favorite, peach cobbler. After lunch, they could take a short walk out on Guano Point. He personally recommended it. Muriel made her way through the lunch line. She loved cornbread, and she loved peach cobbler. The meat looked weird, and she didn't take any. <laughs> The Indians who served her were all obese and sickly looking. They were all so downtrodden. It was difficult for Muriel to look at them, yet they made their living by getting tourists to look at them. She followed Wilbur out to the picnic table. Wilbur's plate was piled high. He did not seem to find the meat questionable. The pilot came and sat down at their table. So, you mind if I join you, he asked. Aren't you going to eat, Muriel asked. No, I'm trying to lose about 30 pounds. 30 pounds, Muriel said. You can't mean that. You're in great shape. No, I put on 30 pounds since I got back from Afghanistan. How was it there? Oh, it was crazy. I like Germany a lot better. <laughs> Muriel didn't say anything. When she thought of Germany, she thought of gas chambers. <laughs> so you want to take the little walk out to Gono Point? Okay, Wilbur said. Muriel went to dump their paper plates in the big trash can. The Russian woman seemed to be having a fight with her daughter, who was sitting on the rim of the canyon, dangling her feet over the side. There was no guardrail, only a precipitous drop into a beckoning void. Just seeing her sitting there gave Muriel the chills. How could her mother let her put herself in so much danger? Perhaps she thought that because this was a tourist attraction, it had to be safe, despite appearances. Perhaps she thought it wasn't real, that it was just an illusion, a sort of Las Vegas. Perhaps she thought her daughter couldn't fall to her death, or the death itself wasn't real. Wilbur and the pilot were already walking down the trail, and she hurried to catch up with them. The trail led them down and onto a narrow peninsula that led out into the canyon. Muriel was all right as long as she just looked at the feet of the pilot ahead of her and didn't look up or to either side because if she looked up, she would have to see that ahead of them, down the peninsula, some, ahead of them, the peninsula simply ended in midair, thousands of feet above the floor of the canyon. And if she looked to either side, she would see that if she made any missteps in either direction, she would fall into the maw, the void that wanted her to fall into it, which was always calling out to her, in a voice she was careful to turn a deaf ear to. The Russian woman was now walking behind her, and the Canadian couple followed in the rear. It made Muriel feel uneasy to have them bunching up behind her. Soon they came to a place where the peninsula got significantly narrower, and the pilot stopped. Muriel took Wilbur's hand to steady herself. The pilot waited for everybody else to come up to him and stop. Then he leapt over the edge, out over the abyss, before coming to roost on a tiny rock outcropping, only wide enough for him to perch on one foot. He stood poised there for a heart-stopping moment. Then he jumped back to where they were standing. Oh, I didn't have my camera, the Russian woman lamented. <laughs> Let me go back and get my camera and my, and my father. Could you do it again? I'll be right back. She hurried off in her high heel boots. In a few minutes, she was back with her camera and her father, and the pilot made his death-defying leap for her twice more. <laughs> Each time he jumped, Muriel felt sick to her stomach. She wanted to run off the promontory altogether, but she was too terrified to move and could barely manage to maneuver herself to a big rock in the center of the path and press herself up against it as hard as she could. She wondered who was watching the Russian woman's daughter and how the woman didn't seem at all concerned that her daughter might fall from the perch on the rim of the canyon where she had left her. It was fascinating and horrifying to watch the pilot balancing on one foot over the abyss. 
Could it be that he didn't care if he fell to his death? Did he want to scare them into thinking they were going to see someone fall to his death? Or was it that he was addicted to the feeling he got when he knew that death was imminent? It could be that for him, knowing that death was imminent was the ultimate high. Yes, she looked at him balancing over the chasm. She saw it was true. He was higher than a kite. <laughs> <laughs>